And finally, probably the most powerful intervention to reduce calories is to eat a high fiber, high plant-based fiber diet. So the Mediterranean diet, but the Korean diet, the traditional Korean diet or the traditional Okinawan diet is fine as well. Lots of vegetable, whole grains, beans, tofu, fish, nuts, seeds. That's what you have to eat. That's, you know, a diet. Okay, how can I control my calories? So I have a few tricks for you that, you know, you could apply in your life. First one to reduce calories is harahachibumi. It means basically stop eating when you are 80% full. A lot of people, you know, they have these big plates and they eat, 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 you know, because they want to clean their plates. But in your Asian traditions, you know, this was ancestral, uh, you know, anecdotes, you know, basically stop eating. You know, in some way, you know, you know, in your tradition, you have these small portions of food. So, you know, eat mo small portion and then stop before you are completely full. So this is rule number one. Another one could be intermittent fasting. So basically, maybe a couple of days per week, you could eat only vegetables. So in this study that I did when I was, was in university, basically people, for two days a week, they were eating only non-starchy, raw or cooked vegetables for lunch and dinner, okay? Dress with two tablespoons of olive oil per day. Remember, one tablespoon of olive oil is 120 calories. So basically, in, in this study, if you fast two days a week, this vegetable fasting, where you don't have to count calories, you can eat as many vegetables as you want, dressed with olive oil and vinegar or lemon or spices, we achieved in six months a 8% weight loss and a 16% reduction in body fat measured by DEX. However, when we measured inflammation and uh, glucose and insulin, we didn't see changes. Because what is emerging from our science is that if you are eating junk food in the feasting days, in the non-fasting days, this is influencing the metabolic response to weight loss. So the shortcut of time restricted feeding, I'm eating everything in eight hours, or I do intermittent fasting as a shortcut, and then you know I eat junk, I eat ultra-processed food, a lot of animal products, stuff like that, is not gonna work. Yes, you're gonna lose weight, you're gonna lose body fat, but you're not improving as much as dietary restriction with optimal nutrition exercise, your metabolic health, okay? And the same is for time sensitive feeding. Again, you know, this is another way, if you like, if you prefer, to eat everything in an eight-hour window. Uh, and, but you have to eat high-quality food in these eight hours. It's not, you know, that you eat junk food in, for eight hours and then you're going to live longer and you're going to have a, a, a better metabolic health. Indeed, you know, this is a study published in New England Journal of Medicine where, you know, they, they, they compared calorie restriction without time sensitive feeding or uh, calorie restriction without time sensitive feeding, and they don't see any difference. So basically, it's just calorie restriction that is mediating the beneficial effect. It's not, the time sensitive feeding is not potentiating the effects of calorie restriction, okay? And finally, probably the most powerful intervention to reduce calories is to eat a high fiber, high plant-based fiber diet. So the Mediterranean diet, but the Korean diet, the traditional Korean diet or the traditional Okinawan diet is fine as well. Lots of vegetable, whole grains, beans, tofu, fish, nuts, seeds. That's what you have to eat. That's, you know, a diet. In this study, you know, we did a study in US, I haven't published it yet, where, you know, we fed people a a Mediterranean diet high in whole grains, beans, vegetables, fish, no meat, no processed food, okay? So by itself, if you eat high quality diet, you're gonna lose weight. And then if you combine with the other intervention and with exercise, there is no doubt that in no, no time, you can reduce your, your, your waistline and your visceral fat. So very quickly, point two and three of the guidelines, of the American Heart Association guidelines. So they recommend eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, choose a wide variety. In US, most of the vegetables are french fries and ketchup. So that's not good quality vegetables, okay? 
sort of, you know, in, in, this mo in the morning, you know, I go to the restaurant here, you know, you have such a huge variety of fantastic vegetables in your tradition that, you know, you should keep eating and not eating refined processed food. Point three of the guidelines is choose foods made mostly with whole grains rather than refined grains. Instead of, you know, in our Western society, people eating white bread, you know, white uh, rice, white pasta, everything it's refined and processed. And so you remove fiber, you remove selenium, you, you remove ferulic acid, vitamins, because you remove the germ and the, and the starch that are very rich in all these nutrients and, and fibers. We will go, and, and, uh, and why is important? So again, I don't have time to go into the details, but one of the main reasons why a high fiber diet is important, this is a paper we published in Science, showing that the most two important nutrients for he a healthy gut microbiota are protein and fiber. So these are the two most important nutrients that are shaping the quantity and quality of our gut microbiome big ways, okay? And you know, there are data showing that you know, the, the higher the variety of vegetable, whole grains and beans, the higher the biodiversity of your gut microbiome. And most importantly, this is, this is not my study, but he's a friend, he's Charles McKay from Melbourne University. He has clearly shown that basically, when we eat a lot of vegetable fibers, the fiber get digested by the gut microbiota to produce metabolite called short chain fatty acids like propionate butyrate. And these metabolites, they are basi basically altering the immune cells in your gut, preventing inflammation, autoimmune disease, and allergic diseases. So what we are finding is that it is this huge increase in type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory chronic disease, asthma, uh, ectopic, you know, kind of uh, allergic skin diseases or, or, or autoimmune diseases is partially due to the dramatic reduction of vegetable fiber consumption through the gut microbiome and the metabolite produced by the gut microbiome. Point number four of the guidelines. This is revolutionary. So when I read, you know, the guys, I said, oh my gosh, I said, you know, basically they say, choose healthy sources of protein, mostly protein from plants, legumes, whole grains, and nuts, fish and seafood, low fat or fat-free dairy, and if, they say, if meat or poultry are desired, choose lean cuts and avoid processed forms. Instead of all over the world, even in your country, people now, they are eating pork and chicken and uh, beef every single day, probably twice a day. That's not good for several reasons. For health reasons, because we have shown that basically uh, a high meat intake is providing saturated fatty acids that are increasing cholesterol, but also studies we publish in Nature shows that, you know, these meat products are rich in sulfur amino acids and brain chain amino acids that are promoting pro-aging pathways by, by inhibiting autophagy, DNA repair, and other pathways. So again, I don't have to, the time to go into the details, but believe me, you don't have to become a vegetarian, but the consumption of meat products in Western society and now in your culture, in Asian society, is too much. It's bad for you and it's bad for the environment. Point number five of the guidelines, use liquid plant oils rather than tropical oils. So coconut, palm, coconut and palm oil are as bad as butter because coconut oil is very rich in saturated fatty acids that are pro-atherogenic, they increase cholesterol. Animal fat, of course, butter and lard are, and, and cream are rich in saturated fatty acids, they're increasing cholesterol, it's a major cardiovascular risk factor. And of course, the partially hydrogenated, the trans fatty acids are very bad because they increase LDL cholesterol, inflammation, and they cause endothelial dysfunction. So the best condiment are probably extra virgin olive oil and canola oil. I think, you know, extra virgin olive oil, press cold extra virgin olive oil, is not only rich in monounsaturated fatty acids, but is also rich in vitamin E, carotenoids, uh, phenolic compounds like uh, thyrosol, hydroxytyrosol, olecanthal, and many other ones. However, be aware that one tablespoon of olive oil is 120 calories. So you don't have to use 
a lot of oil. For example, five tablespoons of olive oil or any oil is basically 600 calories if you have a sedentary lifestyle. Because, you know, back then in, in, in the Mediterranean countries, people, they were working all day long. And so they needed these extra calories from oil to survive, you know, to, to be able to survive, to work. But nowadays in our society, people basically are almost sedentary. And so if you eat 600 calories of olive oil, you're going to gain weight, you're going to gain visceral fat, you're going to get inflammation, you're going to get uh, dyslipidemia, hypertension. So be careful, count your oil, don't use too much oil in your diet. I don't have time to go into the number six, seven, eight, but basically th th these three points are stay away from ultra processed refined food, stay away from soda, all these beverages, sugar, sugary beverages, and stay away from salty food, especially heat, hidden salt. All the, because these three uh, ingredients of foods are very bad for your health. You know? So there are so, m so many data showing that you know, the people eating a lot of soda, uh, ultra processed food, they have a 20, 30% higher risk of mortality, cardiovascular disease, cancer. So these are very, very bad. You should eat real food, minimally processed uh, healthy food that, that was part of your tradition until probably 20, 30 years ago. And uh, number nine, they say, if you do not drink alcohol, don't start. And if you drink, if you decide to drink, drink only in moderation, meaning two glasses per man and one for women. However, remember, one glass of wine is 126 calories on average, and one glass of a big beer, you know, of this craft beer is probably 200, 250 calories. So if you drink, you know, a couple of glasses of wine, two beers in one day, this is like probably another 500 calories, plus without nutrients, plus basically ethanol get metabolized in acetaldehyde that is a pro-cancer, pro-aging factor, no doubt. There is no low dose of alcohol for cancer. There are a so, lot of studies showing that, you know, even small dose of, cancer, of alcohol, they increase the risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, liver cancer. And to re this is a paper we just published in, in the European Heart Journal that is one of the top cardiological journal in the world, re-emphasizing this concept. So, for example, there are a lot of people that, you know, they say, I'm vegetarian, I'm vegan. And because I'm vegan, I'm not eating meat, I'm healthy. No, the data are showing that if you are vegan or vegetarians and you eat a lot of processed refined vegetarian food, you know, vegan lasagna, vegan pizza, full of refined carbs, uh, high corn syrup, salt, and, and bad oils, you know, partial, you have a higher mortality than people who have a healthy omnivore's diet. So, there is not a magic fix. So this idea, I'm vegetarian, I'm paleo, I'm here, I'm there, you know, no. We need to use science to guide our diet and our lifestyle, not, you know, fed fashion and, and other stuff.